my real pleasure to give you this introduction to Cosmic Ray Extremely Distributed Observatory. I really love this project, and I'm so happy that so many of you came here. I counted there is nearly 60 registrants, around 10 countries are represented, and if we speak about nationalities, something like 15. So it begins to be really global. So you understand immediately, even before hearing to me, what is credo by looking to this logo. So we need a global detector, distributed points of detection to catch this kind of phenomena. Extremely distributed in space, ensembles of cosmic rays. And this is also the take-home message, very easy. State-of-the-art cosmic ray research is just one arrow, and credo is more arrows. This is very simple. So I'm going to speak about this. And if you find my talk slightly provoking, it's on purpose, please be sure that the intention is good. And uh, I want to provoke you to criticize, to discuss, because this is good for the project. Date is wrong, sorry. The outline. So, very simple. Why we go global, what we want to do, and how we want to do this. Start with the mission. So, all of you probably are familiar with the spectrum of cosmic rays. Very much, very much uh, uh, elongated in energies, more than 10 orders of magnitude in energy, 30 orders of magnitude in flux, rapidly decreasing with energy. And here, the flux is really extremely low. Ultra high energy cosmic rays, which starts at around 10 to 18 electron volts. But at 10 to 20, you can imagine one particle per kilometer square per millennium. To see such a flux, you re really need to be patient or have large observatory like existing already, taking data, giving beautiful results. Pierre Roger Observatory, 3,000 square kilometers in Argentina. But even if with this instrument, we can have only a handful of events at the highest energies. So it means challenges. Challenges, of course, technical, also scientific. We know that these particles here at the highest energies, at 10 to 20, we know that they exist, but we have no ideas what are they, where they come from, how do they propagate. And in particular, for, the, for, the, for this talk, a question we ask is, do photons contribute to ultra high energy cosmic reflux? And now please imagine an experiment which <laughs> handles or wants to handle all the available cosmic ray data. This 10, 10 orders of magnitude in energy and many, many orders of magnitude in the flux. So this is credo. And why photons are important? Photons at the highest energies. Just because we expect such particles exist. There are two classes to, of scenarios to explain ultra energy cosmic rays. Astrophysical scenarios based on acceleration of nuclei and, so to say, conventional interactions, for instance, with cosmic microwave background. And result of these interactions is a very tiny fraction of photons to be observed on Earth. While another class, so-called exotic scenarios or top-down models, is based on decay or annihilation of hypothetic particles, supermassive hypothetic particles that could be created in the early universe in the inflation epoch with energies at 10 to 23 electron volts. And if these objects, if these particles decay only presently, the result of this process can be observed as large fraction of photons. So large fraction of photons versus small fraction of photons. But you see no class of scenarios that predicts no photons. So we expect these photons. And that's the point. So another thing is that these photons should interact on their way to Earth. 
One possibility is the interaction with the magnetic field, for instance, nearby the sun or in the geomagnetic field. Another interaction could be with the cosmic microwave background or other background photons. So we expect cascades. That's, that's, that's the expectation. In any scenarios, if we expect ultra energy photons, we also expect cascades. And we can simulate these cascades. For the magnetic field, we have pre-shower program. For uh, propagation of ultra energy cosmic rays, we have CR proper. So we have the tools. But we, we somehow, I mean, state of the art approach to cosmic rays is somehow disregarding these cascades. And Credo wants to go into this topic. But I told you that photons are expected, but they are not observed. So here you see the status of ultra energy cosmic ray research. It's even kind of a paradigm already that we do not observe photons at ultra high energies. You see here the data points, these are all arrows, which means upper limits. If we do not observe a photon at ultra energy, we can place upper limit. The most stringent upper limits come from the Pierre Auger Observatory, the largest instrument, and naturally giving the largest uh, possibilities, more, most constraining limits. You, you see also comparison to the predictions of exotic models and standard models. So you see that most of the exotic models are challenged by these limits, while we enter the standard uh, predictions. And the standard sen sentence to be expressed on, on the occasion of showing this plot, I was repeating it many times also in my talks, is that these limits severely limit or constrain the exotic scenarios. But one should be careful. Now I add this star to this sentence to make the audience understanding well that these limits trivially assume that nothing unexpected happens to an ultra energy photon on its way to Earth. And in this way, we really can constrain the models. But as I said, there are cascades, and we do not know physics at 10 to 20. We have a number of fundamental uncertainties there. So can, how can we be sure that the mean free path of a photon which at 10 to 20 is around 10 megaparsecs, is really the number we can take as fundamental physics constant. No, we can have cascades. So this is what is not observed. Ultra high energy photon, if it is produced somehow and nothing unexpected happens, it should reach Earth, but it doesn't. This is not observed. But what if there are cascades and ultra high energy photons have no chance to reach Earth. If only cascades can reach Earth, what if we live in this scenario? This has not been tried so far, and we are going here with Credo. So this is state-of-the-art approach to cosmic rays. I call it very easily N at the top of the atmosphere equal one. Number of particles at the top of the atmosphere equal one. So this particle enters the atmosphere initiates a cascade of secondary particles, which is then recorded by different techniques, ground array of particle counters, fluorescence detector, radio technique, number of techniques to interpret this signal from secondary particles and infer the properties of primary. Okay, and now let's consider a very simple generalization of cosmic ray research when you just go from n equal 1 to n larger or equal 1. Only this. Let us consider that we want to observe to catch more than one cosmic ray particles. So this is what we are going to do with Credo. As I said, observing ultra energy photons, non-observation of ultra energy photons can be meaningful only if we understand well the propagation processes and other things like intimate structure of the space-time, like photon structure, like electrodynamics, if we understand all these things well, if it extrapolates very well from the accelerator region, then we can actually limit ourselves to this case. But what if 
we do not understand the physics of 10 to 20 well. We can try to observe cascades. This is unprobed channel, really unprobed. And as I will explain in a second, it's must check to complete the ultra energy photon study. If we limit ourselves only to this case, the study is incomplete. So here is the generalized detection of cosmic rays where N at the top of the atmosphere is larger or equal one. State of the art, we expect mainly nuclei, proton, iron in between. One particle enters the atmosphere, an air shower is initiated, and we expect a cluster of particle counters on ground to trigger in the same time. Then we have a signature, and we conclude about the primary type. But it is extremely difficult to differentiate between different primary types based on this footprint on the ground. So we need large statistics. But as I said, at the highest energies, we don't have statistics. So what can we do? We cannot be build infinitely, infinitely large detectors, of course. But what if we have unique signature, but we just don't recognize them? What if we have a cascade and it hits distant detectors, not clustered in space, clustered in time? This is a chance for a unique footprint. And this chance is going to be explored with Credo. So to illustrate the argument that it's really untouched ground, let us imagine a cascade initiated by ultra energy photon, but all the particles in this cascade, cascade travel along one line and are not dispersed also in time. So to register such a phenomenon, we are prepared very well. Pierre Auger Observatory can do it. Other cosmic ray experiments can do it. Just because the final air shower induced by such a cascade is a superposition of small air showers induced by these particles. So at the end, we have just one air shower. It is an obvious detection. While here, if a cascade is dissipated, if, this is, if the particles are distant one from another significantly, for instance, if the average distance between particles is larger than the size of the Earth, we will obviously, we will not be able to identify a cascade. If we only one representative particle of the cascade reaches Earth, there is no logical way to uh, uh, infer, uh, to, to conclude that it was a cascade. So it is an obvious extinction, no way for a detection. But what about the between? The between is also obvious unchecked region. If, this, if the distance between the average distance between the particles in the cascade is only larger than the Earth size, we should have a chance to see at least two. So the minimum for a cascade or part of a cascade is two particles. And with this idea, we can categorize our cascades very easily with respect to dispersion in space and time. I think it's self-explaining. The currently analyzed case is only type A. So everything travels with small dispersion in space, space and time. Here we can, type B, we can assume or study dispersion in time. Here, dispersion in space large, in time small, and here everything large. And please note these question marks. As I said, it's 10 to 20. This is a number of fundamental physics questions behind. So if we want to interpret the signal on ground and infer properties of primary particles, we have to assume a lot, assume a lot. This is all unknown. And the cascade approach, I was very happy to discover, discover that this cascade approach is motivated by data. You see the date here is 1983. I was eight at the time. Then I'm already nearly 20 years in the cosmic gray field, and I was not aware of this publication. So I call it now forgotten, maybe treasure, because it reports about a peculiar event from a cosmic gray detector where the number of expected air showers of energy is quite large, 10 to 15, is one, and the observation is 32. It has no explanation within the paradigm physics. Maybe it is an ensemble of cosmic rays. Maybe it is a cascade type B. 
Another example, also 83. It was not the same year when the things were observed. The experiments were independent, but if the other colleagues noticed the first paper, they thought that their result might be worth also publishing. And it is really a something, uh, something important. If this ref letters publishes, then... So another type here, detectors displaced by 250 kilometers and excess of events of, again, not so small energies, nearly 10 to 14 electron volts. And this excess is observed in both stations by 20 seconds. 20 seconds, it's a very large time, very long time, very long. So maybe it's, again, an ensemble type D. Who knows? We can check it. So to summarize this argument that this multi-approach, multi-primary particle approach is really a subfield, a new subfield of faster particle physics. And here you have the conference graphics. So three at a time. How to call it? You can help actually because it's not, not well, it's not stable, the name is unstable. What do we look for? Ensembles of cosmic rays, cosmic ray cascades, super pre showers. You are welcome to propose your, your versions. This is really new. Terra incognita. And the approach, when we realize that the approach is to look for m more than one primary particles, defines a very easily understandable roadmap. So we can, we can consider theoretical scenarios that gives us this cascade. We do then simulations, particle distributions at the top of the atmosphere. Then we do earth shower simulations. Then we ask for the detector response. Different detectors, of course, are possible. And then we either observe or place upper limits. So in any case, we are good. We, we publish, we move, move on with understanding of the universe because this is new. Observation or non-observation is a result. So coming to the scenarios. There is one scenario, only one cascade scenario already included in the state of the art physics. This is so-called pre-shower scenario, presently amassed to study ultra energy photons. And it is about an ultra energy photon which enters the geomagnetic field. Then, in the presence of this geomagnetic field, electron positron pair is created. These electrons emit radiation. At the end, at the top of the atmosphere, you have a bunch of particles, bunch of photons, instead of one primary. And again, here, fundamental uncertainties. Fundamental uncertainties. So this is our type A. And we can actually suppose that it is not observed just because the largest instrument, the Pierre Auger Observatory, does not see it. And another thing, if we just start the same effect earlier in the vicinity of the sun, we realize that the spatial scale of the phenomenon is very, very large. Just because electrons, when they are created here, they have time to get deflected in the field of the sun. And it makes really a size. The, in, the, the studies were not initiated by us, is by Wodek Bednarek last century, but he considered only limited range of energies of these cascade particles. Presently, one of the colleagues, which you will be hearing soon, has studied full spectrum, and it gives a super peculiar signature, a line, line of earth showers initiated by primaries extending like 5,000 or 10,000 even kilometers just because he stopped at 10 to 13. But we know that even 10 to 12 electron volts photon can give a signal on ground. A very peculiar, you see, this is a line. Actually, the thickness is one meter. Niraj will, will show you. The thickness is one meter while you have 10,000 kilometers here. So why don't, why don't we just check for this kind of effect, even in Auger? And better, in a global array. It has not yet been tried. OK, coming, coming, going on with the motivation. I've recently attended a very, very nice, important conference at CERN Photon 2017. And the 
conference was dedicated to understanding photon. So what people do to understand photon, of course, they have accelerators and the great large fluxes one can study, one can conclude, but the energy is, is limited, TeV. Now we have also gamma rays, gamma astronomy. We know these photons are there, energy is up to PeV probably. And only one representative of this field was present. So this is really giant field in terms of participants. This is small for this motivation. And then I went also with this range, EEV to ZEV. ZEV is 10 to 21. But I emphasized the phase transition from n equal 1 to n larger than 1, because n equal 1 is practically excluded by the evidence. We simply do not see single photons reaching Earth. But do we see cascades? Who knows? We have to try. And if we do see cascades, this is an important thing, and it might give hints to photon structure. Another thing, I've mentioned in the exotic models, top-down scenarios, the energy is 10 to 23. So we look for manifestations of physics at 10 to 23. But this is the scale for grand unified theories. So we really bite this. Another thing, Lorentz invariance violation. It is expected in GUT uh, theories. It is expected that Lorentz invariance is violated. And in this case, you have dispersion relation altered. By this term, it can be written in another form, but I took this one from, from one of the references. So we have this parameter kappa, which is already heavily, strongly limited. Sorry, this should be, this should be plus. By the evidence from gamma ray astronomy. Why gamma ray astronomy can help? Just because this kappa tells us whether the per production of a photon on the way to Earth is suppressed or enhanced. And this is a critical difference. If this is po positive, per production is suppressed, so we expect more photons reaching Earth. If we do not see these photons, we constrain kappa. On the other hand, we have per production enhanced if kappa is negative. And then, photon lifetime can be extremely short. Extremely means one second is, is, is nothing. In, nothing. In this case, no ultra-high energy photons can reach Earth. But we don't know. We are not sure whether kappa can be only positive. If this is negative, all the photons limits with, within the paradigm are a trivial note. We do not see photons just because they have no chance to reach us. So this is the illustration. Alternative dispersion relation, kappa positive, elongated, uh, elongated pr uh, formation length, so more photons should reach Earth. This is normal case, and this is uh, enhanced per production, so it happens quickly. This, is, this has a critical importance for ultra high cosmic ray search. If we see cascades, it would point to negative kappa. And now, uh, strong thing. You may, you may prepare your tomatoes. Experimental quantum gravity. But it's not my invention. I was, I was happy actually learning very recently that people are considering experimental approach to quantum gravity. Of course, why do we need quantum gravity? We have quantum field theory, beautiful thing. We have general relativity, beautiful thing. But this does not match. So we need quantum gravity a theory that would embrace all the physics we know. And please, you might take, this is a very nice review, Jacobson and Tal. It considers concepts, phenomena that can be really observed in terms of Lorentz violation at high energies. And please note this part of the text I've extracted. So he leaves partial, partially leaves windows on quantum gravity and the number of things, actually, this is only one. But we can bite both with gamma rays and with credo, because credo contains gamma ray astronomy. So this is only the one I mentioned before, photon decay. This is photon decay. This is a window to quantum gravity. 
Okay, and then I was Googling for some graphics and I discovered that people are already considering <laughs> this thing for a longer, longer time. This is a conference uh, five years ago, experimental search for quantum gravity, quite a number of people, and they are focused on gamma ray bursts if they uh, consider astrophysics. They also consider time delays. I've mentioned the two literature examples with time delays. Time delay might be a signature of a very intimate structure of space-time. Is our space-time really, really smooth or does it, have, does it have some structure? Space-time foam, you can Google it out. So this is, this is the topic. And the credo approach adds one more dimension because we will not only check for delays, we will also check for spatial structure. So I, I'm going to contact these people. I, I wonder if they will be happy. Okay, so I've told you about the roadmap, long, long roadmap to publish something. But there is a shortcut like in IKEA. You can go quicker. If you find a unique signature that does not fit to any of your models, you could publish as well, as we've seen already. So, so I call it phishing. Phishing is also ongoing with us. And what is phishing? When in the classical approach, in the state-of-the-art approach, when you, when you hunt for n equal 1 and you look for clusters of detectors in space, neighbor detectors triggering at the same time that tells you that an event came, you can, at the same time, for the same infrastructure, you can look for clusters in a, in a small time window. Small time window, so clusters in time, not necessarily neighbor stations. This could be a way because you do not, you know the rates in each detector and you can look for excesses. Moreover, you can look for some order, order in arrival times. And this, this, this kind of trigger already has a name. I wrote a more general slide, but it is being already on the way to be implemented in OGE because it does not interfere with the current setup. So it's easy. You just need to, to manipulate slightly. And please, please take a note of the very, <laughs> very small letters here. So I try to calculate a, a chance probability that uh, for a given rate, this is more or less like the rate for a single OGE station. And uh, let us assume that 30 stations trigger in a small time window, microsecond. This is, if you don't read it, if you can't read it, it's very good because it says ridiculously small chance, ridiculously small chance. So one, one would ask, what is NLO? Maybe not 30, maybe 10, maybe 5 is enough really to have 5 sigma excess. So we can look for such excesses which, of which we can be sure that they are not random. So this is briefly the mission summary. We, we verify scenario, scenarios and we do phishing, scientific phishing. Okay, now what is needed to, to handle this mission? And this is credo, this is kind of chronological status March last year, one of the conferences I attended. So I told a very colorful slide, open project involving all the existing techniques with some central, um, central server. Then in August last year, we already have inauguration. So you basically have a globe, the dots, some of them see the signal in a, in a narrow time window, and we look for this kind of phenomena. And the dots, how to get, we need two things. We need large areas covered by detectors, scintillators, whatever, but we also need a spread, a global spread. How to reach a global spread? Maybe with this. A smartphone can be a detector. We have a lot of people on our planet, and why not to attract them to science and ask them for help? So this is important thing, and you will hear more about it. Inauguration meeting exactly a year ago, quite successful, you can still access the talks. And now we, we are one year after this with some progress, I believe. Then the structure by like today. So we have some sensors, could be whatever, smartphones, uh, 
a car represents uh, maybe professional array. Professional experiments also should join. It is on the way. All these experiments are somehow contacted already and they, they express some interest, but the inertia is large, so it takes time to, to arrange some formal agreement. So we need professional instruments, we need amateur instruments, we need to provide some designs that are easy, for instance, pocket detector for 100 euro, if somebody wants to take more muons, then it, he will buy. Central computing facility and storage, we already have this, thanks to Stronet, we will have a talk. Then we have interfaces enabling different things, like analysis, we have a very easy analysis format, which is accessible for age category, I estimate a seven plus, and we will hear a talk about it. And we have a very nice thing here. We can have alerting. So we've seen, we've heard, gravitational waves era has just began, and people are trying to identify also inf information, corresponding information from other channels, like cosmic rays, like neutrinos, like gamma rays, and we will come with our cascade alerts, if we have any, of course, of course. Then the outcome is, as I said, scientific result in any case. And how are we going to do our job? So what tools will we have? So this I've already mentioned. Marek Magrish will have a talk. We are very happy that Citronet is ready to host the global project. Global project. It's a real thing. Then, application. Uh, please come to hear the Piotr Poznański's talk. Inauguration of our application, which will be open source, available to everybody. Unlike the other existing applications, which are closed, restricted access with few users, we need millions of users. We need to distribute application as widely as possible. Okay, and what could be even more funny than applications on a smartphone? So I, I'm speaking about toys. Toys, thanks to my daughter, I realized that toys is a target. So this is how cosmic ray detection looks now. We have different techniques. They are isolated. They do not speak to each other. So we are going to make connections and to organize an open global analysis. This is credo mission. But look at this. We also, I visited a toy store with my daughter and I've realized there is a shelf called educational toys. Isolated educational toys. So why not to make connections? Why not to make the thing more funny and take data with simple counters and again, upload educate, by the way, introduce some gaming into it, some competition, some networking com community features. This can help us and this can help ch children or rather younger colleagues uh, to get really into science, actually. You start early. If you want an Olympic medal, you start early in the preschool. So why not to start the scientific career in the preschool as well? How an ensemble of cosmic rays can look like? So you see a map here, and the dots represent detectors. And what we, what we can do in a very easy way to analyze this image, we just introduce some time window. This is a time window, and we plot a scatter plot of arrival times in this window. Then if the signal is random, the average arrival time should be located in the very middle, in the very middle of the window. So the point should be located in this red line. But if there is some signal, the signal should introduce departure from this middle line, which is well seen here. This is simulations. Simulations. We do not get excited too early. Uh, simulations with some noise plus signal. And the easiness lies in this that even a child 
can really tell whether the points are on the red line or departed. This is very easy. And why do we need these children? Can't algorithms do the job? Of course. Of course they, they can. But please keep in mind that we might be looking or fishing for something completely unexpected. So we don't know how the signal looks like. And if we do not know, we can, how can we train algorithms? What is the training set? It's impossible. Algorithm can tell you, well, this does not, think, does not fit to anything. Okay. And we have this set of things which are strange. And what next? We need to find some subsets, some structure, some characteristics. But this is really a job for human eye. This is at least the present, <laughs> present uh, understanding of the business. OK, uh, then another thing, uh, how to analyze these map, maps. We already have an interface. This is a project, uh, a joint project of Kedo and Asterix. Uh, also a lot, of, a lot of work done by Joe here, if not 99%. So we will have a talk. This is easy, this is existing. You can immediately actually log in and classify the maps. OK, this was about tools, now the users. And I've, I've told you that we need young people. So these slides illustrate my view why young is good, is one of the arguments. But please take into account that when you really study something deeper and deeper, you might find yourself in this situation, that you don't escape. You don't escape from your, from your study. While younger colleagues, they dig here, they dig here, so they have some freedom. If these two talk together, there must be, might be a change to tunnel from the wrong direction to the real treasure. OK, and in this context, I would like to introduce to you uh, also a fresh initiative dedicated to young science enthusiasts, incubator of scientific discoveries. This is the schematic uh, illustrating the idea. Distributed environment means that we have many locations, not necessarily in one city. Like now, it can be international. Why not? And the projects that are sitting over more than one location, using resources from more than one uh, uh, member institution, maybe with help of some external partners. So this is what we have right now everywhere. Universities have students, they well, run projects, but this is not inter-institutional. We think that a synergy can be obtained by distributing, by joining, by talking together. And the, this is, again, existing already. We have young people from incubator in the audience. One of them, Mateusz, will be speaking tomorrow about the incubator, showing very nice examples, some workshops, some projects ongoing. So this is already existing. The website is, um, is, is there. The address is, maybe not, not this one, the address is incubatorof.science, if you want. And my advice to these colleagues is that they go global as soon as, as they can. We already have a global meeting here, so why don't you talk to other, other colleagues and, in, and uh, ask for interest. OK, now training. This is also my, something funny. Have you been trained to discoveries uh, in, your, in your career, during your studies? Have you, have, have you had a lecture how to make a discovery? Can one be trained? OK, these are the questions that people can ask themselves. So we ask these questions in the incubator. And we think it's possible to train for discovery. So, but we don't know how, because it's not, not existing, actually. There is no literature, no, no thing like this, at least to, to our knowledge. So first guest training is really do science, think of the obstacles for independent thinking, try to realize that they exist, try to list them, then practice the ask, art of asking questions. Asking questions is very important in scientific career. And I was giving a mini, mini series of lectures in this direction. And then I realized that it's not really a training. It's rather a discipline. You, you, may, you may again criticize. This is all, all new words. So discoverology, the, the art of 
preparing for these coverages. Please take note, choiceology, what choices do we make on our way to discoveries? Are these choices, are these decisions scientific? You can ask yourself. Of course, you have experience, you have intuition. But is the choice, the very choice of direction, for instance, top-down or standard scenario, is this choice motivated purely logically, scientifically? I think no, but you can think of this uh, subfield. You can also think of the mistakes that are included in our paradigms. I, I, I can give you an example in a second. And again, you can ask about questions. You can ask about questions. So, choiceology. What is actually your vision of the universe we are living in? Do we have more unknowns or rather a small piece of knowledge is, 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 to, be, is to be found? So, this is again with help of my daughter. And this is a choice which you need to make because if you think we live in universe B, you will focus only on this small piece. And it limits your scientific actions. While here, you are more open. Of course, it might distract you. But you might think of different things, not only this small piece. So this is a choice. And this is not scientific. And aerology example, the error discovered by myself in a very standard reference uh, that is the basement of the pre-shower effect by Herber 166. Very old, very basic, very fundamental. And please note the factor of two difference in the critical function. Function critical to determine the per production probability. In the plot, the numbers are factor two different than in equations. If you take equations, you do right. If you take the plot, if you are lazy to, to write the, the program to calculate the equations, you do mistake. And this reference is widely cited. So any publication based on this reference producing some conclusions, but not explaining whether it was taken, the, 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 the numbers were taken from the plot or from the equations, is useless. It's useless. So this might affect our final, final uh, results. If we believe blindly to everything, then we might go into the dead end. Okay, and the questions, the questions are important. One of the important questions one, one has to ask here is does it really make sense to, to join Credo, but we believe it does. And this is my summary, version one, mission, n larger than one. So we both test scenarios and fish for something unexpected. Strategy is that we want to spread globally and we really need to be a giant. We really need to be a giant, otherwise we can stop. Tactics, so variety of detectors, free to everyone, design or ready-made box or do it yourself, whatever variety, then users, young plus old, and training. So version two, and samples of costing race or other names, it's really unprobed. Channel Terra Incognita might be a desert, who knows? We just enter the land and we will see. The detector is already operating. You can stay tuned. And the potential is quite clear. We address top science questions. We have data everywhere and for free. We already have detectors. We do not need to invest in principle. We can have very cheap detectors and we are multidisciplinary. So please visit our website. If you have not yet joined Credo, you are welcome. And for those of you who ask whether this business can give you some money, so this is the latest news. We've just got a grant for the project called Credo. Not so big money, but is the, is the first one, right? So people recognize the strategy science and education in this case, in one. Not science plus some side effect, educational effect. It's all combined with Incredo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Piotr. Uh, does anyone have any questions for our speaker?
Thanks, Peter, for your talk. Uh, I have two technical questions, very short. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned about two observations, two analyses of very wide showers and very long in time, but one of them 20 seconds. Uh, they were analyzed in 83. Why there is so big time gap between 83 and now? I mean, uh, either those uh, detectors didn't work. I wonder longer. myself. <laughs> To me, it's a big surprise that I was not aware of these publications. So it means that the standard state-of-the-art physics is very focused and not open for mysterious observations. Mysterious means, means not repeated by others. Those two, ex those two results were not repeated by others, and that's probably why they were classified as artifacts. Nevertheless, published in a good journal, right? So it's not that it's known that these are artifacts. We just don't know. These are mysterious events. So with Credo, we are easily prepared to verify both and maybe others. Okay, the second question to you and maybe to Henry Gilczynski. Uh, technical questions about registration, about time correlations. You told us that till now nobody tried to find correlation in time between signals registered, found by various... Uh, on a uh, global scale, no. On a global scale, no. But is it possible? I, as I suppose, all those signals, all those data are saved somehow. Is it possible to go back and reanalyze them, looking at, at time correlation? Of course, I can, I can give you the answer. We have this data in Auger, and since a year already I've been asking to access to this data and to do the analysis. Time clustering on our share scale. And they allowed you to? It's on the way. Inertia, right? Again, not mainstream. So people, of course, has to be focused on the things they know will bring a publication, right? This is unknown. Digging out the old data and make them useful requires the effort, uh, uh, and this is why it takes time. It's not obvious how to do it. Uh, it is, uh, in principle, possible uh, now when every experiment uses GPS time. It may not be that easy for data taken 30 years ago. Then we probably will not be able to correlate that well. Okay. But still. Uh, uh, we have uh, mm, to keep in mind that uh, in many instances uh, we will face uh, a trivial problem that if some event has been at the very early stage of data acquisition classified as a background, it has not been recorded, ciao, we will do nothing. Maybe I, I will just add one thing. So. Background. So background is thrown away to a dustbin or the trash can. What is the best word? <laughs> so we are going to dig in this dustbin because we like background. We just look for correlations. This means huge amount of data. Huge, really a challenging, challenging for computing, for storing, for everything. And if you realize that you need dustbins for every, from every big experiment, then you realize that you need a really good support. And we have one. Any questions from video users? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Piotr.